Dan Sunheim is also our final interviewee of the day today. Dan founded D1 Capital in 2018, and I suspect I'm not alone in considering him, considering him one of the best investors of his generation. D1 now manages over $20 billion, $10 billion of which has been deployed into 70 fast-growing private companies, including Stripe. We have the co-founder of Stripe, John Collison, here to interview Dan. Stripe builds internet infrastructure and is currently valued at around $100 billion, making it one of the most valuable private companies in the world. In Silicon Valley, the Collison brothers are widely considered the heir to Jeff Bezos in terms of being world-class operators. John, over to you. Thank you, Graham and uh, Dan. Delighted to, to be here with you. Good to see you, John. Thanks, Graham. Thank you, Graham. Um, okay, let's start off with an easy question. So uh, it seems like over the last 25 years, you know, US GDP has grown at 4.5% a year, the stock market's grown at 10% a year. And so, like, what is that mismatch? Or why is it sustainable? I've actually never been able to figure out why the stock market grows faster than the economy. This is an easy one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, looking forward to the rest. Um, I think Elon Musk actually uh, posted on this on Twitter. Uh, so I started thinking about this when he did that. Um, I think it's a number of things. I mean, uh, one really straightforward one would be interest rates. Um, I think the bigger one, though, is increasingly a mix towards international earnings. Um, so the more that companies trading on the U.S. stock exchange are earning internationally, your kind of U.S. GDP is, you know, stat not static growing, but uh, and then you're adding more and more earnings internationally. Um, I also think. Um, we've offshored some of the more capital intensive aspects of the economy to China and other countries over the last few decades. And so the margins of a lot of US companies have uh, have gone up. Um, and Is there an effect where the, you know, the, the, the giants are doing really well, you know, we'll get into Amazon and Facebook and everything uh, later, but you know, they're performing really well as very large businesses. And you know, people confuse like the S and P 500 is not all companies. And so is there some amount of us where large companies are succeeding more than small companies? Yeah, I think I don't have the, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think the margins of large companies have gone up a lot more than the margins of smaller companies. Um, if just measured by like, you know, the Russell or, um, and so, you know, the composition of the S&P 500 has changed a lot um, over the last decade. And actually, it's changed a lot almost every decade. But um, more recently, you have like a huge part of the index in a few companies. So that's going to, again, skew everything. And, you know, those companies are growing faster than, um, you know, certainly the certainly GDP, but faster than most companies that are even a fraction of their size. And, and now very profitable, too. So if we talk about these GAFAs, you know, uh, stocks are on sale today. And uh, say we decided that, you know, we had a career chat and you decided that you were going to stop hedge funding. You wanted to focus exclusively on the Hornets. And uh, and so you're going to, you know, uh, just wind down all the whole, uh, you know, day-to-day uh, uh, -day trading activity. And I say you have to put all of your holdings in one of the four uh, uh, GAFAs uh, for the, and you can't touch it for the next 10 years. You know, uh, 10 years you're allowed to kind of open up Yahoo Finance uh, or uh, I guess Bloomberg for you uh, East Coast types uh, and uh, and see what happened. Which do you pick? What's define GAFA? Oh, like any of the, the I mean, Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Apple, maybe you'll allow Microsoft in the consideration set. Uh, yeah, I'd say Amazon. Um, I just think that like if you're going to put all your money into something, you know, durability of business model is probably the most important thing. I mean, I think they all have incredibly durable business models, but um, you know, Amazon's uh, durability is not built upon technology. I think it's it's a logistics company in the, the day, and just like railroads, you know, 100 years ago, um, and uh, you know, other forms of transportation that were just dominant logistics companies. I think Amazon's going to be very difficult to displace over. Even look forward 50 years, it's hard for me to see how um, they're not delivering packages, you know, faster to people than everyone else, and have better network, and, and obviously AWS that has, you know, some technology risk uh, to some extent. But. Um, I guess, uh, you know, for a firm called D1, uh, which is a nod to day one, right, Amazon's philosophy, it, it's maybe not entirely surprising that that uh, you'd be so convicted on them. I mean, when you, when you all think about Amazon and valuing it. I actually don't have a sense for how you all as a firm work that clearly 
you know, uh, very strong management culture, huge adjacencies that they can expand into. They've proved that they are able to open new lines of business. So there's a lot to like, but um, I, I presume that tweet length thesis, you know, you can't charge two and 20 or four and 40 or whatever it is these days uh, uh, to just, you know, have that tweet length uh, 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 thesis. You need something longer and kind of more involved. And so how do you all value someone like Amazon? And is it kind of, yeah, they're kind of worth it at any price or are you actually pretty valuation sensitive or? We're, we're very valuation sensitive. In, in all stocks, I mean, it's one of the things that really drives a lot of our uh, investing activities. Um, we lead with valuation, you know, valuation, business model, and management team. We look at three things. That, you know, we don't spend a lot of time trying to predict quarterly earnings. Um, in terms of Amazon, you used to have to do a lot of uh, mental gymnastics to value Amazon because there weren't a lot of earnings and a lot of businesses were nascent. There's a lot of investment. You know, but now it's gotten to the point where, um, you know, Amazon's kicking off a lot of cash flow, even though they're investing a lot. Um, so I think Amazon's probably trading around 20 times 2023 gap EPS. If you you know believe, obviously it's higher than the street, but I think that's possible. Um, and if you, you know, they'll still be growing, you know, way north of uh, GDP, clearly multiples of GDP. And if you look out like, you know, 10 years from now, I'm not sure that Amazon has to the multiple, usually multiples obviously come down as growth rates slow. I'm not sure Amazon's multiple, if it's 20 times, if I'm right, it's 20 times 2023. I don't think it has to come down because you look at, you know, business like Costco um, trades at a higher multiple than that. Uh, and obviously grows at a fraction of Amazon. And why? It's like, you know, multiple obviously has a lot to do with growth, but also to do with durability of cash flows. Mm -hmm. And Costco is viewed as being extremely durable. They're a low cost provider. You know, they, they sell staple like goods. I mean, Amazon we go back to my prior statement about Amazon being durable for 50 years, like uh, 20 times earnings is a 5% free cash flow yield, which you know, if, you, if there's something that you have a ton of confidence is going to be around for the long term and grow, that's very good relative to any, you know, other alternative. Uh, another retailer that you obviously have been very high conviction on for a, uh, a long time is uh, Instacart. What, what, what was it that, that led you to such conviction about Instacart? Yeah, I think that um, like it was it was watching how advertising advertising dollars had moved offline to online, you know, whether it's Google, Facebook, all these different categories. And some of the biggest um, advertising budgets sit with the CPG companies, um, you know, the Heinz's of the world, the Campbell Soups. Um, but, you know, nobody goes in, not nobody, people don't go into Google and search for like ketchup, like you know, I don't buy some ketchup. Um, you know, they, they go to the supermarket and so there's massive amounts of dollars being spent. Um, but really inefficiently offline. So if grocery shopping moves online, um, then ad dollars should follow and the ROI should be much higher than those ad dollars online. The same way ROI is higher on Facebook than it is you know, advertising in your local classifieds on a newspaper. Um, so I think that um, long-term, uh, you know, the real uh, value of uh, online grocery will be derived from uh, advertising. I mean, sort of the core business is you know, will be profitable, but grocery margins are slim um, and CPG margins are quite, you know, robust. So I think that's going to fund the move. This seems like an interesting thing to uh, to dive in on because obviously part of what makes uh, D1 uh, uh, special is uh, you all started on the public side, but now do a lot of privates. Do you say how much privates you do or it's a lot? It's about it's about half of our capital. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, uh, really a lot in the uh, the private space. And you know, as I've talked to you about this stuff, it feels like you're kind of marrying the uh, you know what you might get in VC around a lot of energy on the current business uh, and uh, the founding team and everything like that with this macro view, like you're talking about with Instacart, which is you know the CPG advertising and where it's moving and things like that, and you kind of marry those together. Is that what differentiates? D1 and privates, and is that why you guys got, got into it, or why did you get into privates? Yeah, we wanted to find, uh, you know, our our goal is to invest in the best companies in the world and uh, hold them for a long time. And so, you know, uh, investing privately allows us to identify those companies earlier, and get involved earlier with bigger stakes. And also, we like working with the management teams, um, get to know them, get to know the businesses. And so, um, rather than wait for a company to, it just didn't make sense to us if we're going to hold a company for five or 10 years, why wait until the IPO, you know, to learn about it? Um, we, we can invest earlier. We don't invest so early that it's like a business plan. We don't do Series A typically. Um, but once there's product market fit and, you know, the business, the competitive, 
structures established. We can, you know, I don't care whether it's private or public necessarily. Um, so, you know, that was the idea. That is the idea. How how did you get LPs on board with this? Because LPs, obviously, in the hedge fund world, uh, you know, tend to like redemption rights and you know the the the, the control uh, of being able to withdraw their money when they need to. And um, privates is a very different kettle of fish. Yeah, when we launched the fund, um, to be honest, there wasn't much enthusiasm to invest in our private fund. And I don't like you know I don't hold that against any of our LPs because uh, my track record was 15 years primarily in public markets. Um, you know, when I invested my own personal money in the fund, I made it up to 50% privates. Uh, but we asked LPs to do up to 35%. And I think people were reluctant, but um, you know, we had uh, we had good demand uh, to invest in the fund. And we basically said to people, like, you have to kind of trust us that we're going to um, do the right thing with your capital in the private markets, and that we'll be able to, you know, calibrate between private and public markets, see where the better risk reward is, and allocate capital there, as opposed to having two different funds, if, you know, if you have a private fund and a public fund, you're going to do private deals and you're going to do, you're going to invest publicly. Like, you know, the theory is if you have one fund, you allocate capital to wherever the best opportunities are. And that changes. I mean, it changes, you know, all the time. Um, if I'm a founder, uh, you know, there's, there's many things you could say about 2021, but uh, lacking in uh, you know growth stage or late stage uh, uh, investment capital is probably not something you could say. And so, if I'm a founder, why do I go and work with uh, D1? Yeah, look, our reputation's everything, and our reputation's built built upon being a great partner to founders, working closely with them, uh, doing the right thing, um, you know, helping them in whatever way we can, whether it's you know recruit candidates. Um, help them with strategy, help them with the IPO, uh, help them with our network of other founders. Um, and, uh, you know, there's certain things we do. We don't invest in compet direct competitors of our portfolio companies. There are certain core principles that I think uh, are important to the kind of founders we want to invest in. And uh, we don't, you know, we stick by those principles. Um, you yeah, know, at the end of the day, you're only as good as your reputation. And so we, you know, do everything we can to make sure that founders have a good experience with us. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll quickly change gears, and uh, I want to, uh, you know, we, we just drive some accountability. I want to grade your predictions from uh, you appeared on stage at Sone in 2019. Uh, I was actually there, and you were on stage with um, uh, Gabe Plotkin and, uh, and Graham. Uh, and so uh, you, you obviously didn't call a pandemic, so uh, uh, maybe dock you a point for, uh, for that. Um, you said uh, uh, Tesla uh, was maybe a, a good bet, and obviously that was uh, maybe not fully consensus at own, so you might, uh, I don't know, maybe you, you should do more of course, of yeah, I, didn't, I didn't buy it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said it on stage, and that's what counts. That's um, important. You, you said uh, that Canadian cannabis was a bubble, and that has proved to be true. And so what what was it that, uh, you know, gave you um, gave you conviction on that? I mean, just, just, just growing marijuana is not, there's no moat there, right? So it was, uh, you know, it was, there's a lot of excitement because it was uh, being legalized, but the core unit economics were never going to be very good in growing marijuana and canada should never be a natural place to grow marijuana you're not gonna be the low-cost producer of growing marijuana in canada and um, you know just not conducive to growing marijuana um so it was just like you know you get these excitement these bubbles where people get overly excited about things you had a lot of retail investors and so that that wasn't a terribly difficult call of that sitting here two years later this is the outcome the difficult call was was going to go up 100% first before it eventually imploded. Um, you said you've given up shorting, though. I haven't given it up, but we've uh, we've definitely altered our approach. Why? Why? Well, look, we um, uh, after January uh, became clear to us that you know, there were just risks out there that we couldn't uh, we didn't see prior to this uh, in terms of the way social media can uh, affect you know short selling, and so. We wanted the shorts to be smaller uh, in absolute level just for risk management purposes. Um, and then, you know, it comes down to um, we still short stocks, but return on time. Like we, don't, we don't want the team to be too big. You know, we, we think having a team be, you know, tight and uh, having cult, we, we really value culture a lot. So we don't want the team to get too big. And um, so we only have so many people and so much time in the day. And uh, if the positions on the short side are going to be materially smaller than the positions on the long side, or our private positions, you know, we have three businesses: we have privates, we have 
you know, uh, long stocks and we have short stocks. And, you know, I'd argue, you know, privates hopefully should be our most lucrative given that, you know, it's illiquid, so you should get a premium. Um, historically, you know, our long alpha is quite substantial. And and shorting, uh, we I think we can be a good business over time. Um, but, um, yeah, I think you, you short stocks for two reasons. One is because you think it's a good business, it generates alpha. And two is for risk management purposes, you want to mitigate volatility. Um, I don't particularly uh, worry about short-term volatility. So the idea of shorting stocks as a, you know, mitigate to, you know, market volatility never really resonated with me. It was always just to generate alpha. And, um, you know, I could probably add a bunch more people and, uh, and still do as much shorting as we do now. But, you know, my, uh, my view is that um, I'd rather keep the team tight and focus on the things where we can generate the most alpha, which is how, like, at the end of the day, I think that's how we determine how much value we're creating for our LPs. Is there also a, like a lifestyle, uh, life cycle thing going on here where when you were starting with smaller amounts invested and maybe more of a need to, not that you exactly need to prove yourself when you were starting out, but you know you certainly need to prove yourself less now. And so when you're starting out, maybe you want to manage down volatility and um, uh, it's easier for it to, to kind of make a difference. Now that you're investing tens of billions of dollars, it's both harder for it to actually matter and you can just say, yeah, it's going to be a bit more volatile and that's how it works and your you know lps would be fine with that i mean as you get bigger shorting becomes harder because the you know the worst companies don't get to be you know mega caps usually like once in a while you get enron but that's that's quite unusual so um you know almost by definition as uh, fund sizes get bigger short alpha should diminish uh more than long alpha should so that's just another another reason and then there's like look um you know uh, shorting, I, I started my career shorting stocks. I mean, that's how I got my first job. I uh, was by doing a short report. Um, but like betting against uh, growth, betting is, is betting against people. It's just not, it, you know, it's not the way I really enjoy spending my time. Like I'd rather spend my time helping a founder who has an amazing idea and amazing business, you know, grow it to be multiples of its current size. So mm -hmm. it was like, all kinds of factors uh but um look at the end of the day we want to deliver value to our lps and we measure that by alpha and we think that we're going to generate a lot of value. do you think lps are irrationally volatility averse for their own interests look i i i hate to generalize because lps are just there's so many different lps um but i think that um human nature places uh, a premium on um, reduced volatility in the short term, um, I think at the expense of higher returns in the long term. Um, I personally don't, um, I, people like I, I've read articles, they say I have an amazing risk tolerance. And I actually think that I have very list, little risk tolerance, it's just how you find <laughs> risk. It's like, is risk that like, you know, tomorrow my portfolio could go down 20%. If that's the case, then I'm entirely risk tolerant. If risk is that, three years from now, I've impaired capital, then I have no tolerance for risk. So like, I don't think you can actually make great returns without taking the risk of short-term volatility. And we, I've always had a lot of short-term volatility in my returns, um, but I don't have any tolerance. We buy the kind of companies that over the long term, I, I think the risk of impairing capital is quite low. Yeah, and so I guess, yeah, the, the long only shift actually or longer only uh, helps with that risk aversion where yeah maybe you know you can argue about what the you know price will be you know two years from now but it's clearly a really high quality business i mean amazon is not going anywhere uh, and so uh, i guess that's part of how you can sleep better at night yeah i mean we uh, uh we only buy businesses that we're comfortable holding for many many years uh uh we're careful about valuation um and uh and we have a long duration so mm -hmm. Um, I don't need to short stocks to hedge the companies I buy, um, you know, but I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with shorting stocks. It's, it can, be a, you know, I don't think it's evil. I don't think, I think it's, you know, it's good for markets uh, and we do it. It's just not, you know, front and center, the most important thing that drives our firm. Yeah. As, as we talk about shorting, you know, obviously there's been a lot of ink spilled on the casinoization of the stock market of late. And, uh, you know, I actually had a realization recently that back home, betting online is legal for normal things like horses or soccer matches or whatever. Whereas here, 
online gambling is not legal. Uh, and so as a result, uh, you know, people are buying out of the money call options on SPAC vehicles and all this kind of stuff. And so has that affected any of what you all do? Or are you mostly trading different assets than, um, than the, the, the casino crowd? Uh, I think if you go back to my comment on January about like, you know, what social media can do and, you know, not- Is January a euphemism for GameStop? January is a euphemism for GameStop, sorry. Okay. okay. Just okay. I mean, and GameStop would be, you know, would you know, be a euphemism for like everything that happened, you know, during that that period, it wasn't just GameStop. Um, but, um, you know, certainly retail investors uh, create a lot more short-term volatility which you know is generally fine with me, but um, on the short side, if there's a lot of uh, volatility, shorts are different than longs. Like when longs go down, you know your capital goes down, but you know it, it, you're actually like the the position size just gets smaller. When shorts go against you, leverage goes up, so and position sizes get bigger. And so um, from a risk management standpoint, I think that like anybody who's transacting in the market with a completely different strategy than I'm doing should be good. For me, mm -hmm. right? Because if I'm playing football and you're playing basketball, like it's fine. Like, you know, I can play my game, you play your game, but, um, and your game should give me opportunities. Like, if people are gambling on stocks and not paying attention to long term fundamentals, that should be good. But the gambling creates really excess volatility. You just have to be aware of and be careful of, especially on the short side. Yeah. Okay. So it's created excess volatility, but that's mostly good in kind of a Mr. Market sense. Yeah. I don't think, like, I don't have anything against retail investors betting or whatever you know we're going to do i don't i can't imagine on average it's going to be an amazing you know return if you're day trading or buying options on you know things one week out you're eventually probably going to lose um but uh you know for my business in particular it just means we have to size shorts a little bit differently and just be aware that there are players in the market who are quite aggressive and playing a different game yeah uh, let's talk about you. Um, first off, uh, I feel like I get uh, texts from you in either groups uh, or, or kind of one on one at all sorts of crazy hours of the night. How much sleep do you get? It's. I mean, I sleep in like spurts. Like you know, in my job, it's like you get to get over time. Like I used to invest a lot in Asia, invest a lot in Europe, and so like you wake up every three hours. I get a call from the trader. The blah 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 is happening, and then like your body clock just goes to like sleeping in two hour increments. And wow. this is not like something I recommend. It's actually That's real dedication to craft. Yeah, it's something I think I'm really trying to move away from, but it is just a bad habit. Um, so I think in aggregate, I probably get not enough sleep, but not as little sleep as you might think if you look at my text in the middle of the night. Got it. Okay. And then the other thing I've experienced from you uh, uh, in, uh, in in some of our discussions is, you know, you'll say, well, I'm not a macro guy. I don't know anything about macro. And then you'll give this like incredibly coherent, well thought out macro view. And so, uh, you know, woke up the headlines this morning of 4.2% inflation. Uh, and obviously, uh, uh, you know, lo lots of uh, prognosticating happening over what's going to happen over the next, uh, you know, one or two years. What, what is your macro view that's informing the investing you're doing? You're, talking, um, you're not a macro guy. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that um, the problem with having you know macro views typically is they tend to come out in like extreme statements. It's like people like to say like it's going to be the 1970s or it's going to be Japan and like. But it makes for great CNBC watching. Yeah, like at the end of the day, like that's like a that that can happen, and I'm not you know, but that that's a very small percentage of the potential outcomes. Um, and so I think that the, you know, my, my view is like, like the Fed's probably uh, being way too lenient on uh, you know, monetary policy. I think that, you know, there's a lot of savings built up. There's a lot of pent up demand. And, um, but like, you know, the, the Fed changes course all the time. It's like, they're, they're not, you know, we'll see. Like, you know, they don't know that much more than, than we do. And when they get proven wrong, they will uh, adjust. And I think that's their view is that it's easier to adjust by, letting things go hot and tightening you know more aggressively we have to than it is to let things go um go sideways or go you know or decline because once you get you know there's only so much liquidity you can pop into the system before you're kind of running out of bullets that i think that's the general idea and i, I don't have any reason to believe that's not accurate i think the market tends to overreact on both sides like when rates went to like whatever it was, 50, 70 basis points in 10 years, like it didn't mean that every tech stock should be up hundred percent. Like that's just, it's just math. Like, you know, how, yeah. how much of your like of Amazon is that it's a perfectly inflation hedged business? Oh, I mean, actually like 
well, I think Amazon's probably more inflation hedged than uh, people would think. But right now, the market's treating Amazon as if it's like directly negatively impacted by inflation. Um, and I think that there's probably, you know, on a, I guess it's probably neutral if I were to say like, you know, if you looked at the fundamentals of Amazon, like uh, I'd say they're not a huge beneficiary inflation, nor are they probably terribly hurt by inflation. Um, but um, you know, why is, why is Facebook trading at such a cheap valuation? Facebook, I think, look, I think social media has, uh, Facebook's always got a cheaper valuation than the other companies. I think that the moat is a little bit harder to feel great about over 10 years for the market. I'm not saying this is not my personal opinion. Um, you know, just um, because, uh, you know, things like TikTok come out of nowhere, or, you know, Snapchat, you know, Instagram kind of came out of nowhere. So, like, I think social media, uh, the experience in, you know, Facebook's only 14 years, you know, I don't know when they went public, maybe it was two, you know, 11 years ago. So it's not that, it's, you know, and over the course of those 11 years, it's been public, which is not that long in, you know, market history. There's been, you know, Instagram, they had to buy, I mean, WhatsApp came up, they, you know, had to buy that. And then you had TikTok, which obviously they haven't bought, but it's like, there's just a lot of things that are coming out them. Whereas like, yeah, you could argue that like Shopify um, is a risk to Amazon, but not really. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, and uh, Disney, you know, I don't think it's a really risk to, to Netflix. So I think that uh, people are always think that social media has less durability. I actually think that um, the last 10 years are probably the wrong uh, mental model to use for the next 10 years because um, yeah, I think that the big social media uh, businesses have been established by now. And, um, you know, I think that uh, Facebook's probably has a better chance of being, um, you know, the most important platform in the next generation of social media than anyone does of displacing Facebook. Meaning that, like, I think that if you believe, which I actually am not sure whether AR, VR is the next big thing in, in social media, Facebook's likely to be the winner. Um, I think that's more likely than somebody else coming in of nowhere and you know displacing a ton of uh, engagement on Facebook. So um, Mark is like a Roman general. He's like a very impressive leader. Yeah, I, look, I, I think the more I meet people from Facebook, the more I'm super impressed by the team there. Um, yeah, the only thing I think only you know knock I'd say on mo a lot of the the fan companies other than Netflix perhaps and Google more lately is they just the capital location has been poor um historically and um so i think um the opportunity would be for these companies to get more aggressive uh in buying back the stock since they're you mentioned Netflix and uh, one, um, uh, Graham's asked me to pull actionable stock picks out of you. Uh, and so uh, I will try to, but for as long as I've known you, you've basically, you know, if I was to ask you to kind of condense yourself into one stock pick, it would just be, you know, investing isn't that hard. You just buy Netflix and go to sleep. Um, uh, what is it that has historically given you such conviction on Netflix and how do you feel today? Yeah, because I think we think about like, what is the moat that, you know, determines a company's like future and uh you know, the mode that netflix has uh i see as being um not penetrable uh because um the, the amount they're spending on content and the reach they have uh, allows them the content is a fixed cost and the more you can sell that over a broader reach um you know the more you can bring down the, the costs you know per person you're selling it to so effectively you have this flywheel where they're spending more and more on content um, but not raising price as much as they're sending on content to the end users. So the value to the end users going up and up, invest more content, invest more content. And it's, it's very difficult. Like even companies like Disney, which we own, uh, it has, you know, built up amazing franchises for decades and decades and decades. Um, I think they will be competitive in their own right, but they're not going to displace Netflix. Um, it's, I think it's over. So I don't think anyone can displace Netflix. I think, um, and I think that uh, the world in 10 years is going to be entirely streaming. Um, I don't think that there's going to be you know, any linear cable. Um, and uh, if you believe that, then there should be 500 million subs Netflix. They should be getting 20 bucks a month, uh, well north of 20 bucks a month. And um, that'll still be an amazing value proposition to the consumer. The one of the things we look for in companies that we, take huge stakes in, are they, are they providing a lot more to the consumer than they're taking? So like, you know, Netflix, I think, if you think about Netflix, you know, at the current 
price, um, what you're getting relative to, you know, what uh, they're taking in price is like a huge gap. Uh, you know, you cost a hundred bucks to buy a cable. Um, and Netflix costs a small fraction of that. But increasingly, the content on Netflix is almost as good as the entirety of the cable bundle. The content on TikTok's even better. That stuff's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't watch that as much, but. Um, oh, you're missing out. Uh, I'll send you some good ones. But um, uh, do you guys model the uh, embedded pricing power in the password reuse and kind of account sharing in Netflix? Because presumably that's a big part of it where they haven't cracked down that they could. That, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't, they, they've been reluctant to do that historically. I think their view is like, we want people to, as many people as possible to enjoy the content. And you can always go and do that in the future, you know, if you want to uh, correct them. So they haven't, they haven't done it. Uh, we don't model it explicitly, but you know, there's, there's opportunity to, certainly there's a lot of password sharing. Uh, what do you think of Albert's uh, Twilio thesis from the prior section? Uh, I thought uh, I actually was part of the uh, the panel that that chose that as the. Uh, ah, so you, th you think it's a good oh, idea? Yeah, I thought it was a great idea. Yeah, idea. Yeah. We don't own Twilio, but I think it's a great idea. I I want to I want to end on maybe a a, um, a squishier topic. Uh, one, one more um, uh, question about you. Uh, I feel like most hedge fund managers make. I won't say most, there's a lot of uh, bad bosses in the hedge fund world. Uh, and I know what it is. Maybe it's like big egos or, you know, being a good investor doesn't necessarily make you a good manager. But like, I feel like you hear a lot of stories where it is like something out of HBO Billions or, or, or something. And I've talked to a lot of people who've worked for you and they really like, you know, working at, at, uh, at D1 and working for you. And so what is it you think makes that work? And what advice would you have for than sometime 15 years ago or, or 20 years ago or people kind of earlier in their careers? Yeah, well, um, we try to look at our own company the same way we would look at companies when we're investing in them. We try to have the same kind of thoughtful approach. And uh, we invest in companies in the private side, particularly we look at Glassdoor reviews. And if the Glassdoor reviews are bad, it's a pretty big red flag. Um, and um, you know, for, for our business, you know, we don't have factories. We don't have that many assets. I have a relatively small team. We, we try to, we're trying to make it seal team six, not like a battalion of people. And I think they're all stars. And so we treat them the same way, you know, an NBA team would treat, you know, their team if they had a world-class, you know, championship team. And we, we, we treat people well, not just because, you know, they're great and, and value the business because also it's just the right thing to do. And like, you know, we, um, uh, when people choose to work at D1, I think um, I view it uh, as an obligation on my part to make that a great decision because people who choose to work here are super accomplished. They've worked hard their entire lives to get to this place. And, um, you know, if I don't provide an amazing work environment or opportunity, then like, um, you know, I failed them. And I'm not, you know, it's important that uh, reputationally that we you know, don't fail people internally and don't fail people externally and do what we say we're going to do. Um, so what, what advice would you have for the early career done sometime? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm doing a bunch on this call watching. Don't, don't, don't short GameStop. Yeah. I mean, like, look, it, you know, I think it's like, you always wish that you could go back and like, you know, knew everything, you know, now then, but like, to me, like, you know, uh, life and investing and this job is, is, is a journey. And like the journey is fun. Like it's not always fun. Like today's not fun. And you know, January wasn't fun, but, uh, but generally it's fun the process of learning and, and experiencing and, you know, that's more of pattern recognition. So like, I think I probably wouldn't want to tell myself too much because the process is like, you know, is a lot of the thing that makes this fun. Is, is there anything in the vein of um, errors of commission versus errors of omission? Or, you know, you hear Druck and Soros uh, uh, talk about, you know, their big bets and uh, uh, Druck saying that where Soros really helped him was in uh, ensuring, you know, to size the bets appropriately and to actually act on his conviction. But, you know, do you have any reflections in that vein? No one's ever needed to do that with me. That comes <laughs> <out really. laughs> uh, so I have no problems. I, I have no problem. Uh, I don't need to borrow conviction from anybody. Um, I uh, so I don't worry too much about errors of omission because look, there's so many ways to make money in the, in the markets and investing. It's like you know, if you beat yourself up about everything you miss, um, 
to me, like things that you miss are not an opportunity to beat yourself up. Things that you miss are an opportunity to learn. Um, and so like, why did I, you know, not buy Shopify at a hundred? What, what, what was, what could I have seen when the stock was a hundred that I, that next time I won't miss it. Um, and, um, you know, that's more important to me than like, you know, getting upset about error mission. Cause it's like, you know, there's a hundred times more errors of omission than there are, uh, wins. You don't need to get everything right. You need to get a few things right. Plus, um, I mean, on Shopify, presumably in retrospect, the combination is market leader with uh, uh, extremely strong management team and lots of expansion opportunities. And so uh, to close, where are we missing such opportunities today? Which companies? Uh, let's see. I mean, um, I am quite bullish on, uh, and, and some of our private investment activities are informing what we do in the public side, but I'm really bullish on uh, uh, used car sales online. Uh, we have investments mm -hmm. privately in Europe, in Latin America, and we hold a big position in Carvana in the US. And you know, I think that um, like the simple thing, the simple analysis is this is a way better consumer experience than going to a lot and negotiating with a used car salesman. Um, and so it's a better value proposition and there's massive economies of scale. And so just keep taking share year after year after year. So I think you look out 15 years from now, I think you could see a case that 30% of used car sales are done online. You know, they own 65% of that market and the stock is many multiples of where it is now. And we see that playing out like in every geography around the world. It's like, yeah. this is you know, it's kind of common sense. I bought my Ford on uh, shift. It worked great. Um, alrighty, uh, we will have to leave it there. Dan, this was so much fun. Thank you. And uh, yeah. Graham, I will we'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Dan. That was fantastic. Thanks to all our speakers today who gave us the gift of your time and incredible ideas to help us raise money for high risk, high reward research at Rockefeller. I hope to see everybody in person a year from now in New York City. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks again for tuning in.